I think we can start. So start slowly, <laughs> so then people are slowly uh, okay. connecting. So uh, we'll Please. come back to uh, this uh, series of lectures. Last time on Friday, we discussed in the second part uh, the annihilation of an electron and positron into hadrons, and we discussed uh, in particular their alpha s corrections, which uh, uh, consist of uh, real, so so called real corrections, where uh, on top of the quark anti quark uh, of the tree level graphs, one has an emission of a gluon into the final state. And we discussed the virtual corrections, uh, where the final state is the same as a tree level, but uh, the amplitude or the conjugate amplitude uh, receive uh, an alpha s correction. And we discussed in particular that uh, separately uh, these. Uh, uh, graphs, uh, if calculated with massless partons, have certain divergencies which cancel uh, for a deep reason uh, in the sum of everything and therefore in the total cross section. Uh, when I discussed this uh, slide last time, I already pointed out uh, that, of course, you may also consider uh, uh, the same graphs, but uh, be more curious about the details of the final state. And then here uh, you have uh, three partons. First of all, uh, that of course, because of confinement, you do not see in the final state, but uh, these partons produced in a short distance uh, uh, process, uh, they have a further history, if you like, and will eventually turn into hadrons. And that's uh, what uh, the uh, remainder of uh, this set of slides is about. It's about so-called hadronic jets. So uh, simply, uh, Put simply, a jet is a bunch of hadrons that move approximately uh, in the same direction, and that overall uh, is rather energetic. And the underlying idea is that uh, what we have uh, in uh, Feynman graph uh, calculation uh, that uh, speaks of quarks and gluons, that at high energy, these quarks and gluons eventually turn into uh, jets. And in, in fact, one may say that a jet uh, is perhaps the most direct manifestation of quarks and gluons. It is different in important uh, aspects. For example, the quarks have uh, uh, electric charge of uh, some uh, multiple of uh, a third or two thirds. Um, and the quark and gluon uh, have net color. And none of this is true uh, for uh, hadronic jets, which are made of colorless hadrons. And as you know, hadrons don't have third uh, charge um, as we uh, know them. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, it is a rather direct manifestation uh, in the sense uh, that the uh, large energy momentum of a jet uh, roughly follows the large energy momentum of its parent uh, parton. And that you can see uh, in uh, this collection of three jet events in E plus E minus, they precisely correspond uh, to this type of graph. Now, for a three jet event, this is actually the lowest order, whereas it was a uh, higher order correction for the total cross section. Um, this was taken at the first collider that had high enough energy uh, to distinguish uh, such uh, three jets in an event. And you can see. Uh, well, there were not too many particles in each of these jets, uh, and the energy of each jet wasn't too high, uh, but it was uh, enough to see this pattern. And in fact, that was extremely important at the time, because one can say this is uh, really uh, the discovery of the gluon as a particle, because uh, it is a really direct manifestation of uh, the fact that uh, one does not only uh, produce a quark and an antiquark, which at the time were known uh, to couple to a photon directly, but something on top which couples only to the quarks, but not to the photon. So um, if uh, you go forward in time and to a different type of process, uh, this is a jet event uh, that was measured at the Hera collider, which collided positrons. The positron uh, came from here. And protons, the proton came from there. And what you see in this event display is uh, here something which uh, left its trace in the electromagnetic calorimeter, but not in the hadronic one. That uh, was the scattered positron. And that was something that had its trace uh, also uh, 
in the uh, hadronic part of the colorimeter, and that is indeed uh, uh, an hadronic jet, as you see it here also in this Lego plot. Uh, so this is the uh, sometimes called the current jet uh, that uh, you get in deep inelastic scattering uh, by the uh, electron or the positron knocking out one quark uh, from the proton, turning it around in its direction. Uh, and uh, then this quark manifests itself as a jet. Last example of a jet event. This here is from the uh, earlier days of the LHC. Um, this is a dye jet event. Protons, two protons collided. And you see here in the azimuthal uh, angle very nicely how the transverse momenta of these jets balance. Uh, and uh, you can also see that uh, the energy deposition uh, is really very localized for these jets. This uh, thing here you might see as a little bit of a substructure in the second jet. Um, and I'll come to that in uh, just in a second. So the idea of jets is very much tied to the idea of hadron uh, of part on hadron duality uh, that I mentioned uh, in the last lecture. Uh, and it's an extension of it in the sense that one uh, assumes here um, that the dynamics which leads to the partons at the short distance uh, time uh, space time scales, uh, set by a large scale to the finite state hadrons, which on the scale of one for Q is uh, almost infinite, um, that this dynamics uh, roughly conserves the momentum. Uh, this is why we have uh, these, uh, this energy momentum uh, very much focused in one direction. It doesn't conserve color or charge, as I already said before. But it, it's thought that uh, the effects of uh, this hadronization dynamics uh, changes momenta uh, by something at the intrinsic scale of non-perturbative uh, QCD, and that's uh, something like the GEV or sub-GEV scale, whereas the very large momentum of the parent uh, hadron is uh, uh, not changed uh, by uh, this. Now, uh, if one wants to be quantitative and more precise, one has to say, how exactly do I define my hadronic jet? And the, the structure I pointed out here already makes it clear. You have to have an algorithm that decides, is this here one jet? And does this uh, deposition of energy belong to that jet? Or uh, do we think it's, uh, or do we assign it uh, to be outside the jet? And uh, that kind of precise definition uh, is done by what is called a jet algorithm. Uh, so uh, this is just a, a detailed prescription of how uh, you are supposed uh, to collect the information from individual particles in the event uh, and assign it uh, to a jet. Now, there are many, many uh, such uh, jet uh, definitions and jet algorithms, uh, but some of them are better for theory than others. Namely, if we want to be able to make uh, theoretically controlled predictions, uh, then the jet algorithm had better not be too sensitive uh, to the part of the physics that we understand least, and that is the hadronization effect. So in particular, uh, this definition should not be sensitive to collinear or soft radiation, because as I explained you last time in detail, collinear or soft radiation uh, is precisely uh, where uh, virtualities of the particles involved can become small, or if you uh, do a loop into calculation, they become even if infinite. And small virtualities means uh, that you are outside uh, the domain where perturbation theory is trustworthy or stable. So uh, a jet algorithm that has this property that it doesn't care uh, the assignment uh, doesn't change uh, when uh, you have a collinear or soft radiation. And this here sort of is an example. Think of a gluon uh, pair annihilating via a top loop to have a Higgs boson. And in the same uh, uh, event, you could have a hard gluon radiated. And that hard gluon would make a jet. Now, if that jet, uh, that gluon before it comes a jet, uh, radiates a collinear gluon, this here is not a perturbatively well-controlled uh, thing. Uh, therefore, the jet algorithm uh, should group this into uh, one jet, just as it would be, be uh, doing uh, if uh, this uh, emission, this collinear emission had not taken place. 
So this is called a collingeran infrared safe jet algorithm. And there are other algorithms which for an experimentalist are in principle fine, but uh, for which theory uh, has much less chance to predict something uh, on firm grounds. Now, if you have such a safe jet algorithm, then what you do in practice is uh, you apply that algorithm to the hadrons in your measurement. And the theorist applies the same algorithm to the partons in a Feynman graph calculation. And then uh, both of them have a definite result. And uh, what remains to take into account in the comparison is that, yes, there are some corrections uh, to the parton level calculation from hadronization, but they should be moderate and uh, typically uh, decrease uh, with the uh, transverse momentum over the energy of the jet. And one way to estimate uh, these hadronization corrections is to take a specific model for hadronization which uh, is implemented in uh, different Monte Carlo generators. Um, and uh, having a, one such model or several such, such models, uh, one can try and quantify uh, these uh, corrections. And that is done what's in back, uh, also in practice. Now, you might ask, what is a good jet definition? Well, what is a good jet definition depends really on the uh, purpose, what you are interested in. Uh, so there are really, uh, there is a, a large choice of different jet definitions which are good or better for certain purposes and not so optimized for other. So it really depends uh, on the physics you want to extract from such an event. Uh, in addition uh, to uh, grouping particles into jets, uh, you can also look at structures inside a jet. So that is called uh, typically set substructure observables. Uh, you can, for example, look how many particles are there in a jet. That would not be a collinear and infrared safe uh, question to ask. Uh, but you can ask how is energy and momentum uh, distributed inside the jet. Uh, that would be collinear and infrared safe. Uh, and uh, this has become uh, in LHC times really a very valuable tool uh, to try and reconstruct uh, the underlying uh, dynamics at the parton level. And it's a very active field of research. So that brings me to the end of this uh, uh, block, which was left over from last time. If one goes beyond tree level, then perturbative calculations in QCD um, are possible, but only for quantities that are infrared and collinear safe, which means that uh, you have quantities that are dominated by large virtualities and large virtual virtualities means uh, small uh, coupling. Uh, and that is what you need, of course, for perturbation expansion uh, to make sense. The simplest examples we have seen, it's total cross sections or decay rates for colorless initial states. And uh, if you go to differential cross sections, uh, then uh, because uh, the uh, compensation of uh, virtual and uh, real contributions uh, becomes uh, incomplete, you can have large double logarithms, double logarithms, uh, meaning uh, one logarithm uh, in angle, uh, one logarithm in energy uh, for each uh, soft or collinear emission. And uh, finally, uh, I have just given you a flavor uh, of uh, jets, uh, what jets in the final state uh, uh, can be uh, used for, and that uh, there is really a wealth of suitable observables uh, to uh, try and quantify the physics of jets. So this brings me to the end of this block. At this point, I would like to ask if there's any question before I switch slides. Any yes. questions? I have, I have a question part? if I ask. If yes, you can. please. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, when you talked about uh, the hadronization correction, yes, you said that uh, it's uh, moderate when a PT becomes large. Am I, am I right? Well, yeah. That's what should happen. Yes. Yeah. But this is uh, something that happens uh, during calculations, or there is a physical meaning. Um. Well, the jet PT, or you could trade that for the energy of the jet, uh, if this is large, then on that scale, 
corrections uh, at the GEV scale become smaller. So in that sense, it's uh, just a very generic uh, statement. Yeah, this is the large scale uh, in the jet. And that you can think of very roughly as the quantity that the jet has inherited uh, from its parent parton. And whether a GEV uh, on top of that, something like a G on top of that is big or not depends on whether PT is 5 GEV or 20 GEV or 2000 GEV. Okay, right. thank you very much. Sure. Any other question? If not, then let me stop sharing this slide and see if I can now share the other one. So the next block in this lecture, excuse me. <coughs> goes beyond a colorless final state. Um, namely, uh, it's about uh, what is called factorization. And that is what you need uh, if you have an individual hadron in the initial state. And archetypal um, processes uh, of that kind are deep and elastic uh, lepton nucleon scattering or the Drellian process. So uh, let me start with a little introduction, which is not yet about factorization, but about the parton model, which I'm sure you know from introductory lectures, uh, the particle physics. What does this parton model uh, state as a model? It regards a hadron in a, in a frame where the hadron moves fast. Fast means uh, it has a large energy momentum on the scale of a, a, compared with a few GeV. Uh, such a hadron is uh, regarded as roughly behaving like a collection of free non-interacting partons. Partons just uh, means uh, quarks, antiquarks, or gluons, with a low trans, each of them having a low transverse momentum relative to the momentum of its parent hadron. And the prescription of the model to compute something like deep and elastic scattering or Drillian is then compute the cross section uh, for the process uh, in which, for example, in deep elastic scattering, uh, a virtual gamma star scatters from uh, one of the quarks in your proton, could also scatter from an antiquark, and uh, multiply this with the flux or the distribution of uh, the quarks or antiquarks inside your target proton. And that information is contained in what is called the parton densities or parton distribution functions. Likewise, in the Drellian process here, you have two incoming hadrons colliding head on in this frame. And then uh, you can have a quark antiquark annihilating to a gamma star. And that uh, makes then a lepton pair, uh, which is observed in the detector. Uh, by the way, this uh, script L is a, a rather often used uh, notation uh, that is, uh, means uh, it's a generic lepton. So it could be an electron positron pair or a muon pair or even a tau pair, if you like. Although tau pairs, uh, because the tau uh, has such a messy way of decaying, are often not included in such analysis. So uh, the measurement, uh, the first measurements of deep and elastic scattering uh, was one of the milestones uh, towards, the establish, uh, towards establishing the existence uh, of quarks and uh, antiquarks, not yet of the gluon, that came later, as I told you already, and that uh, uh, and resulted uh, also in a Nobel Prize uh, quite some time ago for the uh, heads of the experiment uh, that did this first, that observed this uh, behavior uh, up the slack. Now, what is factorization? Factorization is what we uh, can try and do in uh, QCD, that is in field theory, in order to implement these physically very intuitive ideas of the parton model into a theory. Uh, and beyond just implementing these ideas, it also corrects them. Because this is a model and it's not a perfect model and we'll see that uh, later on. So what this uh, implementation and correction means is for example, uh, understanding the conditions and the limitations of when such a picture uh, works. And these conditions uh, can be conditions on kinematics, on the type of processes, and for a given process, even on the type of observables. Uh, 
it implies corrections. Uh, and one of the most important uh, corrections is that uh, partons inside the hadron are not free. They interact. But if they interact at short distances, uh, then this is described by a small value of alpha s. And then we can do perturbation theory uh, to take into account these interactions at short distances. And uh, on the other side, what the factorization uh, has to uh, deliver to us is a definition of this, what is meant by these parton densities in the model in the language of quantum field theory. And that's extremely important if we want to study generic and special properties uh, of these parton densities. And if we want to uh, make contact with non-perturbative methods in QCD, an example is lattice QCD calculations to tell us something about the parton densities. Uh, if uh, you ask a lattice theorist, can you compute something regarding parton densities with your methods? The first thing the lattice theorist needs to know is what I'm supposed to calculate. Uh, and that has to be formulated in the language of quantum field theory. Now let's uh, take a closer look at uh, some uh, textbook examples for factorization. The first one is inclusive DI, deep in elastic scattering, or DIS. Here we use the optical theorem to uh, connect the total cross section for a, a, a photon, a virtual photon scattering on a proton, giving anything. This is the same notation I had last time. So this X means any final state. Optical theorem allows you uh, to connect this with the imaginary part of the forward uh, amplitude from the initial state to itself. And a corresponding picture to that in the same way that I drew uh, the pictures about the plus e minus annihilation is this here. You can uh, read this uh, line as the uh, cut uh, where the final state is. Uh, this uh, what's represented by X here. Uh, this here then is the uh, part for the amplitude of the graph and to the other side of the cut is the part for the conjugate amplitude. And then it's clear why this here has to be identical to that because both of it represents the initial state of your physical process. So this is measured, uh, for example, in electron or it could also be done in muon proton scattering where this uh, in, uh, virtual photon comes uh, by uh, the radiation from the radiation of a lepton. So what we need uh, to describe this in terms uh, of this uh, graph and corrections is what's called the Birkin limit. The uh, off-shellness of the photon, it's the minus its uh, uh, four momentum squared, which is a positive quantity that has to become large. Uh, and in the limit, we are supposed to take uh, this ratio of Q squared divided by two times proton uh, momentum, uh, four momentum dotted into uh, the photon form momentum, uh, that ratio is supposed to be uh, fixed, and that's Bjorken X. In that limit, the imaginary part of the forward scattering amplitude is given in terms of what is often called a hard scattering coefficient convoluted with a parton distribution. Now, this hard scattering coefficient is essentially the imaginary part of the amplitude for the process not happening at the hadron, but at the parton level. There is some modification to that because literally such a quantity is uh, infinite if you compute with massless quarks, uh, but we'll see how to repair that later. The important part uh, of the second, uh, uh, second ingredient in the formula is that parton densities uh, are independent of the specific process uh, so they uh, appear, the same uh, PDFs appear in many processes, and that is what gives you a predictive power uh, for this approach. Now, uh, a rather different looking uh, uh, process where the same concept can be used is deeply virtual compton scattering, sometimes uh, often abbreviated like this. Uh, this uh, is uh, in contrast Hello. to this totally inclusive measurement a totally exclusive one, which means that you specify all momenta uh, and uh, particles in the final state. So you pick just a very specific, specific final state. Uh, and at the uh, QCD level, that final state is a real photon and the proton. Uh, and that is again measured uh, by getting the uh, virtual photon uh, from uh, radiating uh, of a lepton pair. Uh, 
The Bjorken limit uh, is the same as before, uh, except that we have one more kinematic uh, quantity to specify, uh, and that can be specified uh, by saying what is the value of the invariant momentum transfer from the initial to the final state proton uh, that is uh, conventionally called T. So T is negative uh, in the uh, physical region. Now it is the process amplitude, which is given by hard scattering coefficient times something uh, more general than a parton distribution. Why is not this not the same as the parton distribution we had previously? Well, that's because uh, now we have a momentum transfer from uh, this proton to that proton, whereas before the momentum transfer was zero because uh, we were forced to, to have it zero uh, by uh, the uh, use of the optical theorem here. So these generalized parton distributions depend on more quantities. The two momentum fractions uh, of the incoming, uh, uh, of, of the quark that comes out of the proton and the one that is returned to the proton uh, are now different. That can be uh, uh, quantified in terms of two momentum fractions. And we have this uh, transfer, the, the, this momentum transfer variable T. The hard scattering coefficient in this uh, case here is uh, the amplitude for gamma star scattering on a quark going to a real photon and a quark. That's actually not the full story. Um, since there is an overall momentum transfer, there is another space-time uh, region uh, in which uh, instead of taking a quark out and put, to putting it back into the proton, you can take out a quark-antiquark -quark pair. And that quark-antiquark -quark pair turns the virtual photon into a real one. So the same uh, physics is now described again by this generalized parton distribution, but in a different kinematic region. And the hard scattering coefficient in this case is the uh, uh, amplitude essentially for a gamma star uh, annihilating uh, with a QQ bar pair into a single photon. And uh, both uh, contributions uh, here are included in this uh, contribution uh, in this uh, convolution symbol in the factorization formula. We will see much more about that uh, in the lectures on GPDs, which uh, start tomorrow. Now, coming back uh, to inclusive DIS, um, uh, I want to say a few words about uh, what is called uh, structure functions, um, because they play a, a very important role in the analysis and description of uh, inclusive DIS. Uh, broadly speaking, uh, what structure functions are designed to do is to separate off the uh, QED or the electroweak part from the QCD part uh, in the reaction. So if this here is the lepton being uh, deflected, this is the virtual photon, or it could actually also be a virtual Z boson that becomes important uh, as soon as the momentum transfer here is of the order uh, of the Z mass. You have uh, this QED or weak interaction part here in the amplitude and the same thing in the conjugate amplitude. And to describe the polarization of the uh, virtual vector boson, you need a Lorentz index, which if you like, uh, describes the polarization. So you can package this amplitude times conjugate amplitude into what is called a leptonic tensor, tensor because it has two uh, uh, Lorentz indices here. And on the other side, uh, for the part which is strong interaction physics, uh, you define a hadronic tensor. Now this can, for example, be done in this way. You have a proton initial state that uh, corresponds to this incoming line. You then have a current and another current uh, which uh, correspond to what uh, the photon or the Z boson couples to. So this current uh, operator here uh, is a quark-antiquark operator because that's what uh, these gauge bosons couple to. And then you have again uh, the proton here. Currents uh, or field operators live in uh, position space. So in order to have a definite uh, momentum, for momentum of this uh, virtual gauge boson, uh, you make a Fourier transform. And you take the imaginary part of this again in order to get the total cross section. The uh, physical cross-section for the lepton-proton process is then given by just contracting this leptonic tensor with the hadronic one. So this here is simple to calculate or straightforward to calculate 
uh, using perturbation theory uh, for weak and electromagnetic interactions. Uh, whereas this year it contains all the difficult QCD part. And notice that so far I haven't spoken about uh, the parton model or factorization yet. So the hadronic tensor itself is defined even if you do not uh, speak about factorization. Now, uh, how can we uh, uh, quantify all this uh, polarization dependence, which is in this tensor here? Um, that can be done using general uh, symmetries of the strong interaction, which are there, of course, Lorentz invariants, then on top comes parity and time reversal. Also, uh, the conservation of these currents, uh, current conservation, all that puts constraints on the possible dependence of uh, form of this uh, tensor uh, dependence here. And then one can write down a set of basis tensors which are independent uh, of each other. So this is this tensor, that tensor, and this tensor. And each of these tensors um, is then multiplied by a scalar function without indices, which is just numbered in this way. Now, this is for uh, the case uh, where the proton spin is not measured and therefore has to be averaged over. Uh, if you uh, keep the proton spin fixed in the experiment, then you have further proton spin dependent terms here because the proton spin vector uh, gives you more possibilities to write down such tensors. Um, Side remark is that the third uh, structure function here only happens uh, if you have uh, electroweak uh, gauge boson that is a Z being exchanged. But uh, so in other words, if uh, you are in the region where only the virtual photon is important, uh, F3 can be neglected. And the reason why F3 receives no contribution from a pure photon exchange is uh, precisely a symmetry of QCD, namely parity uh, conservation or parity invariance. Uh, if you have uh, a photon exchange, then both of these currents are uh, the vector current. And then you must have uh, here a tensor which has the same parity transformation properties as uh, two vector currents. And if one knows a little bit about how parity transformation works, one knows that this uh, uh, fully anti-symmetric uh, epsilon tensor here in four dimensions, uh, that this is a parity odd quantity. Uh, so uh, in other words, uh, this tensor in the, the second line here transforms not like a tensor, but like a pseudo tensor. That means under parity, it has the opposite um, uh, sign uh, compared with a true tensor. And a parity odd quantity, you can only uh, get in a QCD quantity, if uh, in this uh, product of currents, you have one current which is parity even and one that is parity odd, that would be the uh, vector current uh, on one side and the axial vector current on the other side. So um, this is a good example where the um, symmetries of QCD, which are greater than the symmetries of the full standard model, actually uh, restrict uh, the possibilities of what QCD can do without being constrained, uh, without one having to do any calculation. Yeah? So the, the absence of this uh, in case of pure photon exchange is a consequence of symmetry constraints and you don't, you, you're allowed to neglect this uh, if uh, Z exchange is not important. So closing this parenthesis, uh, if we have uh, the uh, lepton-proton uh, cross-section expressed in terms of the structure functions and whatever comes uh, out of multiplying the lepton tensor with these basics, uh, uh, with this uh, basis tensors. Um, that just means that uh, the uh, form of the lepton-proton uh, cross-section uh, can be expressed uh, in terms of three functions which depend only on two variables. Namely, these can be chosen as Bjorken x and q squared because these are the uh, two independent variables uh, which are Lorentz invariant and can be constructed from the four momenta of the proton and the photon. And on more, these things cannot depend by construction. So how do these structure functions look like? Here is a compilation of the world data for the uh, structure function F2 as a function of Q squared for different values of uh, x Bjorken X is very often uh, just abbreviated with an X uh, saving uh, the subscript B. Uh, 
And something that's important uh, to note here is that if you are at in a certain range of uh, x values, which is roughly, uh, well, uh, a bit bigger than uh, a tenth and uh, somewhat not too much uh, bigger than uh, four tenths, uh, then the q-square dependence of these structure functions is very weak. So approximately, um, and you have to be uh, at large enough q-squared because if you go uh, with q-squared below a GEV, which is roughly here, then uh, also there you see a very clear um, uh, variation. Um, but there is a region in which uh, one sees uh, approximate uh, Bjorken scaling, as it is called, which says that Bjorken scaling means that a structure function uh, does not depend on q-squared uh, and only on uh, the other variable x. This is precisely what uh, the Parton model uh, picture that I explained earlier predicts. Uh, and the observation of Bjorken scaling uh, in the first slack experiments that I also mentioned uh, earlier, uh, that was a milestone in, in establishing uh, the Parton model. So if one computes uh, F2 in the Parton model, what one gets is one gets a sum over all participating quark flavors uh, of the uh, um, squared electric charge of that quark, which uh, is four over nine for the up quark, one over nine uh, for the down and the strange quark, times x times the sum of quark and anti-quark distributions at taken at momentum fraction equal to Bjorken x. So um, that's the lowest, the, the, the Parton model prediction. And that is what you see in this restricted part of the kinematics uh, here. You also see that there is clearly a region at larger x where you see uh, a very notable uh, q squared dependence, both at large x and at small x. And that means uh, this uh, scaling is not the end of the story. And that is where the uh, Parton model needs to be replaced uh, by full QCD and factorization. So unfortunately, because historically uh, this uh, type of relation here played such an important role, uh, quite often people confuse uh, structure functions with parton distributions and use one for the other. That might be okay if you know exactly the context, um, but it can also be uh, quite uh, a hindrance uh, to clearly uh, separate the different concepts, the structure function uh, is defined in this way, in terms of uh, currents uh, and uh, the target state, and it doesn't care or know about factorization yet, whereas uh, parton distributions uh, are an outcome of factorization, and the description uh, of structure functions in terms of parton distributions holds in large parts of uh, the kinematic space, but not in all parts. Particularly if you go to very small Q squared, uh, this here just becomes wrong and cannot be used. So let's now uh, take a closer look about what factorization uh, does and how we can understand it. And uh, something I uh, would like to emphasize is that factorization uh, starts from a simple physics idea or from simple physics idea, uh, ideas. Um, whereas on the other hand, if you implement it technically, uh, it can become rather complicated. But these complications, which are just necessary if one does the full field theory, shouldn't uh, hide the simple physics idea that uh, are, uh, are underlying uh, this entire process. So here's again my cartoon of a deep inelastic scattering process uh, in the amplitude. And that is how I would redraw that uh, in terms of a more field theoretical uh, type of uh, graph, uh, which has this uh, cut graph uh, form that I explained before. Yeah? Initial state, final state. And uh, since uh, this here is an amplitude, uh, you have also the conjugate amplitude to draw. So the idea physically is that factorization separates the physics that happens at different uh, scales. And as usual, you can think of different scales as different scales in space-time or different scales in energy momentum. 
So at high energy momentum scales, we have quark gluon interactions and we can use perturbation theory because alpha s is small. At low scales, uh, we have the transition from the proton to our partons. And that, uh, is, uh, that information is uh, encoded in the parton densities. So you can think of uh, this picture here as a collection of graphs inside this hard part is the all the interactions uh, at high momentum scales. And you could draw uh, lines here, opening this uh, blob uh, and really compute this in perturbation theory. Whereas this part of the graph here, you can't even literally compute it as a Feynman graph because that would uh, need uh, you to have perturbation theory. Uh, so the better way of thinking about this is that this uh, describes you something like the amplitude for a proton emitting a parton going to anything, and then you square that. So how do we uh, implement the idea? As I just said, we separate the process into a hard subgraph. And what hard means uh, is that all the uh, particles inside that subgraph uh, should be far off shell. Uh, and that is what allows us to do a uh, perturbation theory. Whereas what is often called the collinear subgraph, uh, that is characterized by all, all particles, which you can think of being inside uh, here and uh, the incoming and outgoing partons moving more or less in the same direction in a frame where the proton is fast. And that is what will turn into uh, the parton density uh, when the whole uh, uh, process here is uh, brought uh, to its end. And we'll come to that later. Um, let me uh, pass over this and say a little bit more about how we can then uh, go about and compute uh, or simplify this uh, picture here. Now, uh, K here determines the four momentum of the quark, which we take out of the proton. So if you think about uh, these here as your building blocks, uh, the entire squared amplitude is given uh, by uh, integration over a four momentum K. So this is a fourfold integration of one function that depends on K times another function that uh, depends on K. This here will eventually turn into a parton distribution. Mm -hmm. Uh, but as it stands here, it would be something that depends on four momentum components. And that is, of course, very complicated. So let's see how we can simplify this, uh, making use of the kinematic uh, constraints that were specified uh, in uh, the discussion just uh, a few minutes ago. And to do so, we uh, want to use a, speci a specific set of coordinates, which are called light cone coordinates. So, uh, as you know, physics can often become uh, very transparent uh, just if you use uh, a set of coordinates that is adequate uh, for your physics problem. And that's exactly what light cone coordinates do for highly relativistic particles. So uh, taking any four vector that could be an energy momentum four vector or a position a time uh, four vector, uh, what we define is uh, the sum and difference of the zeros and the third component. So uh, this would be an energy and a three momentum uh, third component here, or it could be a time and a space coordinate here. The one over square root of two is conventional. Some people uh, leave it out, then you have square root of two factors uh, popping up somewhere else. And uh, there are of course uh, two other uh, spatial components uh, in the plane that is perpendicular to the third direction, which you have singled out uh, by this choice. And that uh, in uh, the whole of my lectures, I will uh, denote by a bold phase vector T, uh, both phase vector V, which just regroups these uh, two components. Um, sometimes one puts a superscript T here. If I write something with a pen, I will also put this uh, T uh, because obviously with a pen, I would have uh, some pain uh, to do, uh, produce something that looks like bold phase. So uh, if you take these definitions, then there's a few important properties. So let me write down some of them and you will have a few more uh, properties that you can explore uh, in uh, the exercises. Uh, let's take the invariant uh, project, uh, product of uh, two uh, four vectors. So 
just a way of writing. This here, it's easy to see uh, that uh, in, in terms of the uh, light cone coordinates, this gives you the plus component of the first vector times the minus component of the second. Another term with the role, oops, sorry, of plus and minus interchanged. So if you just uh, write this here out in terms of these uh, combinations, you will see that this here um, gives you V0 times W0 minus V3 times W3. And then uh, what you need for the uh, covariant scalar product uh, is uh, the standard vector product uh, of these two um, transverse uh, parts. And that comes with a minus sign because uh, of the metric tensor. So a simple consequence of that is the square of a four vector is given in terms of two V plus V minus minus VT vector squared. What else is important about these vectors? Let's consider a Lorentz boost in the third direction, so along Z, uh, and it could be a, a boost along plus Z or minus Z, doesn't matter. A, a very nice property of these light cone coordinates, uh, you will remember that a boost along Z uh, mixes uh, the energy uh, and space, uh, third space component of a four vector. And what these light cone coordinates do is that this mixing uh, is removed and a plus component under a boost uh, is mapped onto a plus momentum times a number which characterizes the boost. Now, uh, Clyde. Obviously, the transverse momentum, uh, the, the transverse part of a vector uh, under a boost along uh, the third uh, direction uh, goes to itself. And now comes the price question. Can anyone tell me how the minus component must uh, transform if you have these two uh, conditions established? No one dares. Well, Maybe minus well, alpha. Can you say it a bit louder? Maybe minus alpha v minus. Not quite. Or one over alpha because exactly. the third That's, must be invariant. That's what we need. Thank you very much. In order for this here to be an invariant, and of course the square of a four vector is has to be an invariant under a boost. Yeah? So uh, this multiplication here is compensated by the multiplication with the inverse there, and then the invariance is evident. So this is a very nice property. Uh, and another important property is, uh, uh, and that has to do with the physics uh, problem that we're about to discuss. Um, let's consider a particle that moves fast approximately in the third direction. Uh, that is sometimes called a right mover. or right moving particle. So in terms of the standard momentum components, that means uh, that the mass and the transverse momentum of the particle are small compared with the third momentum component. Yeah. So PT is just uh, square root of uh, P, uh, P, T1 squared time uh, plus uh, PT2 squared. And P3 is positive uh, because, uh, as I said, this is uh, defined to move uh, in the right direction. So if you use uh, the energy momentum relation, then generically you have this here. It's the mass squared plus the three momentum squared and the three momentum squared 
has a contribution from the transverse part and uh, from the third part squared. Under these conditions here, P3 is the dominant part uh, under the square root and you can Taylor expand. That means you get P3 plus the next part, if you know the Taylor expansion of the square root is PT squared plus M squared. I'm leaving out the vector error here uh, because it's a little bit uh, tedious to write with this pen. And there are, of course, uh, further corrections, uh, which you get if you continue to uh, expand uh, the square root here. So by definition, this here is large. PT and M uh, are small compared with P3. Uh, so this here is small compared with that. Now, uh, if uh, you uh, look at the light cone coordinates, these particular uh, linear combinations here, what do you get? Well, P plus is one of the square root of two times the sum of this, which is just approximated here, plus P3. So this is approximately equal to two times P3 divided by square root of two. So up to this uh, square root uh, factor, the P plus moment, uh, the, the, the plus, uh, component uh, of the momentum uh, is as good as the third uh, momentum, which is the momentum, the, the large momentum component of this particle. If in turn you look at the minus component, then the P3 cancels between the P0 and the minus P3. And uh, the first leading contribution is uh, just P squared over M squared divided by two P3 and this the extra one of the square root of two. And this is obviously much smaller than PT or M. Again, because of the conditions I've uh, posited before. So uh, what light cone coordinates do uh, for a fast uh, right moving particle is that uh, they uh, fall into one large component, one very small component, and uh, another small component. Uh, so you have a hierarchy, very big, smaller than very big, and much smaller than very big. And having established this hierarchy is what makes uh, approximations much simpler than if you were to work in the Cartesian coordinates here. Um, where you have the statement that this is approximately equal to that. So let's take that knowledge and see how we can use that uh, for simplifying uh, this uh, four dimensional uh, loop integral uh, that is uh, what you uh, want uh, to uh, uh, write down if you uh, have this uh, graph here. By the way, uh, this graph, for reasons I let you uh, guess, is uh, often called a handbag graph. Okay, it needs a little bit of, uh, of imagination, but uh, some people uh, some time ago thought that this looks somehow like a handbag. So what we, can we do um, in uh, the hard part of the graph, uh, this function h of k? Well, just like the proton momentum, uh, the for momentum k is a right, uh, the momentum of a fast right moving particle, because that's what defines uh, the collinear subgraph. Yeah? So that means that uh, K plus is much bigger than K minus and KT. And in a function uh, which uh, otherwise depends on large components, the hard function, uh, that means that we can neglect K minus compared uh, with K plus. And in, if you were to write down a Taylor expansion here, you could uh, would have the first term. And then as a second term, uh, you would have uh, derivatives of this here times the small component. Uh, sometimes one can actually work with these corrections and analyze them further, but we will not do that here. Now, if you can make the simplification here, uh, then this four dimensional loop integral here uh, simplifies a, a great lot. You will see in an exercise uh, that 
the four-dimensional uh, integration uh, volume here can be written as dk plus times dk minus times uh, d squared of the transverse momentum. And then what you get here is one term uh, which uh, integrates h of k plus times a function here uh, in which the k minus and kt integrals have already been taken out. So our would be part on distribution is in fact not uh, this uh, expression of the full subgraph A, it is that integrated over K minus and the transverse momentum. And the result only depends on the plus momentum. Uh, and therefore uh, you have turned a full four dimensional integral in effectively a one dimensional integral. And that's a great simplification. Now, more physically speaking, what uh, this approximation here is also doing is that the incoming uh, parton, or also if you had an outcoming uh, parton, you would do the same thing, uh, is treated as exactly collinear with the incoming uh, proton, that is as exactly having kt equals zero and exactly being on shell. Because uh, on shell uh, means that k squared, let's see, where is the, oops. Um, here it is. Remember, k squared is 2k plus k minus minus kt squared. So if you set kt squared and k minus to zero, whatever k plus is, then k squared is equal to zero. And that means you uh, pretend that the parton is exactly on shell and has no transverse momentum. And that is exactly what uh, the parton model. Uh, was uh, giving you as a sort of ad hoc prescription. And here you see that this comes out of a, a step of simplification in a field theory, cal theory calculation. So the hard scattering uh, partons uh, that come in or go out are treated as uh, on shell particles. However, in the collinear matrix element, uh, that is not done. Instead, we integrate over KT and over k minus, which you can also rephrase as integrating over kt and k squared using again this relation here. And this is why also sometimes these uh, type of uh, parton densities are called collinear or kt integrated parton densities. Now I said here they depend on uh, k plus only. If you define them in a Lorentz invariant way, then they must be boost invariant. Uh, and then, since they, of course, depend not only on K, but also on P, uh, they uh, depend on the only boost invariant uh, combination you can make, uh, and that is uh, this uh, momentum fraction X, which is the ratio of K plus divided by P plus. So at this point, we use this uh, simple boost properties along Z. Uh, K plus and P plus just get scaled by a boost uh, by a same factor. And therefore, uh, x here is a boost invariant quantity. And that's uh, what uh, eventually the parton distributions will depend on. There is some subtleties uh, related with the spin of the partons, but uh, this I will not discuss in these lectures, simply for reasons of time. So now we are here. Now I can show you what is the field theory definition of a parton distribution. Um, I think I'll walk us uh, through this slide, and then we uh, make a little break. Um, I said before, this year, uh, the subgraph is not really a Feynman graph. It is something more like an amplitude. Uh, and more exactly, we can write it as the matrix element of quark or gluon operators. If it's a quark distribution, you have quark operators uh, taken uh, between a proton state, which uh, represents the incoming and outgoming uh, line here. So what do we have on the right-hand side here? We have a quark field operator. As you know uh, from field theory, a quark field operator, uh, if you write it in terms of annihilation creation operator, that annihilates a quark. So physically speaking, the quark field operator takes out a quark uh, from the proton. And that's what you see in the picture here. Then you have something that's called a Wilson line, which we will discuss uh, later, but not now. Then you have some uh, matrix that has to do with the Dirac algebra and the fact that these uh, quark fields carry spin. 
And then you have a conjugate of the quark field that creates a quark. So that's uh, the thing that, if you like, puts the quark back into the proton. And finally, uh, you have again your proton state, which corresponds to this part of the graph. As we had before, fields live in position space. If you want to speak about momentum components, you uh, make a Fourier transform. And since here we speak only about the plus momentum uh, component, uh, the conjugate Fourier uh, space-time variable is Z minus. And in fact, the, uh, that we have integrated this here over K minus and KT corresponds uh, to setting Z plus and ZT equal to zero. Uh, because uh, if you start uh, with, maybe I can write that down. Oops, if I get the cursor. Somehow this pen always manages to hide itself. No idea why it does that. Okay, let me try otherwise. We have D. Ah, oh, this is really not good. Okay, it doesn't work right now. Let's uh, drop it and instead I say it in words. Um, if you start with uh, d k minus d squared k t, and you have the full d e to the i k dot z, then the minus and the k t parts of the integral uh, just give you a delta function. And the delta function is what sets uh, the conj fully conjugate variables, the z plus and the z t equal to zero. Sorry for this little technical glitch. So this is a, a quantity of the sort that we uh, don't really need to make any uh, reference to QCD perturbation theory. And that's good because this is a quantity that cannot be computed in QCD perturbation theory. And that is how you would write down the definition of a quark distribution. Yeah, so this here is, is very important for the uh, uh, actual logic of what we are doing. We start speaking about graphs and putting graphs uh, or ordering graphs into subgraphs, uh, but at the end of the procedure, uh, the non-perturbative uh, subgraphs, so to speak, are turned into genuinely field theoretical quantities. Uh, there's a, a little uh, subtlety here, which I need uh, to mention. In fact, uh, as it is written down here, this generates not only the quark, but also the anti-quark distributions. Why is that? Well, the quark field operator annihilates a quark, but it also has another term that creates an anti-quark and vice versa uh, for the conjugate. So instead of picking a quark out and putting the quark back, you can also pick an anti-quark out and create one. If you uh, look at this a little bit more in detail, and uh, I'm told that Baba Paschini uh, will actually uh, show you that in an exercise when uh, she discusses generalized parton distributions, which are defined pretty much in a similar way as here, then you find that this matrix element if x is positive, gives you the quark density. And if x is negative, it gives you the anti-quark density at minus x, which is again a positive number, times an overall minus sign. And the origin of that minus sign is easy to understand. Uh, because if you want, uh, if you write uh, down uh, this product here, you have uh, for the anti-quarks uh, the um, uh, annihilation uh, operator before the uh, creation operator to make that the counting operator you need to anti-commute because it's fermion fields and that gives you this minus sign which is exactly that one here. At this point uh, we uh, should make our usual break uh, but before doing so uh, are there any uh, immediate questions uh, to what I've presented so far? Yes, hello. Yes, can you speak uh, loudly enough yeah. so I can hear you? It's better now. I hope. Okay, so please. Okay, um, uh, uh, at the beginning, I think you said uh, 
the, the PDF or the function structure are independent mm -hmm. of the process, uh, how yes. do we know uh, it is? Uh, how do we know it? they are independent of the process? Yeah. Um, well, in a way, the answer is uh, in this line here. This here uh, specifies the kind of hadron you have, the kind of parton you extract, the spin degrees of freedom, the momentum fraction of the parton. It doesn't know about the fact that this appears in the computation of DIS. Yeah. Okay. And if you have a factorization statement for another process, like we have for Drell-Yan production, comes a little later today, uh, then you will see that the same matrix element appears, and you see it's again uh, the same part on distribution. Yeah. Okay. What you have to establish is that for a given process, this type of factorization actually works. And that is by no means something that you can just guess. Huh? It, Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. But wherever factorization in the, the way specified here works, you find the same matrix elements, uh, and in that sense, they are process independent. OK, thank you. Good. So then uh, what do you think, Sergio? Do we make a 5 minutes break? Is that enough? I'm, well, uh, maybe it, we can start at uh, quarter past. We can spot at the quarter past. Very good. Let's do so. So everyone take a break and please be back on time at the quarter past. Thank you. Thank you. Continue everyone back, hopefully. Let's now take a little closer look to the lowest order results of this handbag graph. And as I said before, you are allowed to look inside this hard part of the uh, uh, blob. And if you look inside, well, at lowest order, order alpha s to the, to the zero, uh, and just the electromagnetic couplings, there's just a quark line inside here. So uh, the lowest order graphs, both for DIS and DVCS, for the amplitude of a photon scattering on a proton, is either uh, starting with a quark here or starting with an antiquark here. And uh, let's take a little closer look now at uh, the kinematics. And one reason for doing so is also for you to get some more idea of uh, how one uh, computes with light code coordinates. And uh, in the exercises, uh, we'll get a chance to uh, uh, look at this uh, a little bit further. So let's first of all specify the frame. Let's take a frame in which the incoming proton and the uh, incoming photon are exactly collinear. So their transverse momentum components are equal to zero. That's all there is to specify for DIS. For DVCS, uh, the outgoing photon and outgoing proton momentum could have some uh, transverse momenta that would be PT prime and QT prime. Uh, but they are small and we don't need them in this calculation uh, I'm about to show you, uh, so uh, I don't uh, consider that further. Um, in such a frame, Q squared, which is defined to be minus the four momentum uh, vector squared, is just minus two Q plus times Q minus, no apart from the transverse momentums. And the proton mass uh, by the mass shell condition is equal to 2 p plus p minus. Now, let me write down the expression of q squared divided by xb. xb is Bjorken's variable. So you'll remember that this is equal to two times p dot q, that's the definition of the Bjorken variable, just written uh, in another way. Now, write this in terms of the plus and minus components. Then we get p plus times q minus and p minus times q plus. In the next step, what I want to do is I want to get rid of the minus components 
using this and that relation and trading them for some plus momo plus uh, a component. And then what I get is a minus sign, which is this minus sign here, P plus divided by Q plus times Q squared. That comes from this relation. And for the second term, I throw out the P minus and that gives me Q plus over P plus, oops, times M squared. And now what I'm using is the Bjorken limit. The Bjorken limit says Q squared should be very, become very large. Um, and that means this particular should become very large compared with M squared. So in the Bjorken limit, let me the, write the Bjorken limit as a BJ here. Uh, I am allowed to just retain the second term. That of course is only true uh, if P plus over Q plus in the Bjorken limit uh, counts as uh, something that's not uh, small. But in fact, that's self-consistent because uh, from this to this here, you deduce that in the Bjorken limit, X Bjorken uh, being fixed uh, means P plus over Q plus being fixed. And then uh, I can write down that Q plus in the Bjorken limit is equal to minus XB times P plus which by the way means that Q plus uh, is negative because P plus is uh, one over square root of two uh, times uh, the energy momentum, uh, the energy component of P minus uh, the third component of the P vector. Uh, that for a non shell particle is of course positive. So this here is negative. And uh, what we also have then of course is Q minus using the relation up there is equal to Q plus divided by 2XB times P plus. So what's important uh, to see here is that uh, Q plus is of the same order as P plus and uh, Q minus uh, is given by this. So if I take a frame where P plus is of order Q, then all these components here are of order Q. And one such particular frame where that's just the case is what uh, one calls the bright frame. We'll know that from uh, elementary treatment of uh, DIS. And the bright frame is defined to be the frame in which the energy component of the uh, virtual photon is zero. If you write that in terms of Lycon coordinates, that means Q minus is equal to minus Q plus. And if you plug that in up here, uh, no, if you plug that in here, then that means of course that Q minus is equal to Q over square root of two and that's of order Q as I announced. And by the same uh, uh, analysis, then uh, P plus is of order Q and we can also write down if we wish. So let me just note that here P plus is then equal to Q divided by square root of two over XB. And last not least, P minus is equal in that frame using the mass shell condition again to XB M squared over square root of two times Q. So you see the scaling as it should be for right moving particle. Uh, it has a large plus momentum component and a very small minus momentum component. Now, if we now look at uh, the graph here, what is part of the calculation of this graph is a, a propagator uh, for this uh, quark line here. So that quark line has, uh, of course, four momentum Q plus K. 
And for the propagator, you, we need that squared. In the same spirit uh, that uh, I discussed uh, E plus E minus uh, annihilation uh, in perturbation theory, the quark mass here is set to zero because it's anyway uh, small compared with the relevant scales. What I do want to write down here though is uh, what you know to appear inside uh, the uh, denominator of a Feynman propagator. It's the plus I epsilon, which tells you what to do mathematically if uh, the virtuality here happens to be equal to zero, which it is at some point in phase space. So uh, I remind us of the definition of X as uh, the ratio of the plus momentum uh, of the uh, extracted quark relative to the plus momentum of its parent hadron. Uh, by the way, this is defined to be a plus momentum ratio, which is boost invariant in the type of frames which we are looking at, that is in the frames where PT is equal to zero. Uh, since uh, I have shown you before that uh, the plus momentum for a fast right moving parton is just square, square root of two of uh, the uh, large momentum component, uh, you can also say that this is approximately equal to K3 over P3. And that is what allows me to say that this here is also approximately uh, a momentum fraction where momentum means the uh, ordinary three momentum in the kind of frame we are interested in. So uh, how do we uh, compute this? Well, write down the light cone variable expression of this. So it's Q minus plus K minus times Q plus plus K plus. And there is minus KT squared because the quark will generally not be exactly collinear uh, to the proton. But this here is small, so we are allowed to neglect it on the condition that we find the first term is large, which we will indeed find in a second. Now, what do we have? K minus is the minus component of a fast right moving particle. That's very small, whereas Q minus, we have seen on the slide before, is of order Q, so K minus can be dropped. So better to say approximately equal. Ah, not, not pretty here. Try it again, a bit more neatly. So this is in the limit that's relevant to Q minus. Now Q plus in the Bjorken limit, I just showed it to you. It's XB times P plus and K plus by definition is X times P plus. So the P plus here I can uh, collect together. And as I said, I epsilon can be neglected. Uh, what I get here is two Q minus times P plus, And that is approximately equal to Q squared divided by Bjorken X as I had it uh, derived also on the previous slide. You can look that up. And inside uh, the squared bracket, then uh, we have the X, the minus XB, and I can put the I epsilon inside the parenthesis here because this here is a quantity, uh, a positive quantity. So this is uh, the approximation of the denominator of uh, our quark propagator inside uh, uh, this graph. You can repeat the same thing for the uh, other graph here, but I won't do that because it wouldn't teach us anything uh, new. And instead, uh, I can just now uh, go on here. And by the way, you see that the generic size of uh, this virtuality is the order Q squared, which is the large scale in the process. And that's indeed uh, self-consistent for what we need for this to be a hard process. So we have this expression here. Oh, that part of the expression, especially is the part that depends on the X variable. And uh, there is a distributional identity for the case in which X uh, is equal to XB, uh, where uh, you uh, split this into uh, the principal value part, uh, the principal value uh, prescription under the integral. And there's an imaginary part at the point where X is equal to XB. 
Now for deep and elastic scattering, we are supposed to compute the imaginary part of the amplitude. And if one decorates this graph here with uh, everything else as it is relevant, one sees what we need is the imaginary part of this propagator denominator. And therefore we just pick out the delta function piece. So this motivates uh, y uh, at uh, the lowest order here, which corresponds to the parton model, the imaginary part uh, of the um, uh, photon proton cross section is equal uh, to uh, the quark distribution taken at x equal x Bjorken. And that's what comes out of this uh, delta distribution here. And the cross graph, the one here, is what gives you the anti-quark distribution. And if one uh, walks everything through, uh, that is also uh, again taken at uh, x equal to x Bjorken. Uh, here I have actually specified it's a transverse photon rather than a longitudinal one. And that's uh, again to see that one has to go a little bit further into the details, either do all the Dirac algebra here or use uh, the usual uh, symmetry argument in the bright frame. Uh, but uh, let me skip over that. One finds that the same uh, type of calculation gives you uh, the statement, the longitudinal photon on proton scattering amplitude from this graph with the approximations we are allowed to make uh, is equal to zero. And if you uh, translate that into the language of the structure functions uh, I've introduced before, uh, you get the celebrated relation 2xp times f1 is equal to x, uh, f2. That's uh, what follows from the longitudinal uh, uh, photon amplitude uh, uh, being zero. And that is equal to xp times uh, the quantity that I've written down here. The xp comes out from kinematics. Uh, and again, to see that in detail, one has to do the calculation in full. But I hope you get at least an idea of how this uh, kinematically arises. The important thing is computing the imaginary part of this graph forces us uh, to have this particle on shell. And that's uh, what gives you that the momentum fraction of the uh, extracted quark is equal to Bjorken's x. For DVCS, we uh, need not only uh, the imaginary part of the amplitude, but uh, the full amplitude, uh, because we will not use the optical theorem here. Uh, so in that case, uh, the amplitude for scattering the transverse photon on the proton into a transverse real photon on the proton. Uh, here you have what I've sketchily uh, written here as a GPD, depending on two momentum uh, fraction arguments, X and XP. We'll see that more uh, later. Uh, tomorrow, uh, and also on this uh, invariant momentum transfer T here. So this is the non-perturbative part of the graph and uh, the uh, part uh, from uh, the uh, propagator here gives you a principal value integral over all X of one over XP minus X. And uh, there you get uh, the uh, imaginary part and that is the GPD evaluated at X equal XPJ as it's written here. So this is for the first part of the, uh, the first graph here. Uh, the cross graph has another expression, which again, I do not bother to write down. Okay, now we have looked uh, quite a bit in detail of a factorization type of calculation uh, at tree level. And before we go to higher order corrections, uh, let's take the same concept uh, but uh, apply it to more complicated uh, and other processes. And uh, also historically, uh, one of the most important processes uh, in proton-proton collisions with two incoming hadrons is the Drell-Young process, where you produce a lepton pair, which can come either from a virtual photon or it could also come uh, from the decay of a, a gauge boson, a Z or a W. And again, it's an inclusive process. Uh, you uh, specify that there's a lepton pair and anything else uh, in the hadronic final state. Now you need one pattern distribution for each proton and the hard scattering. So the sketch uh, that you would draw is this one. Now a very important uh, remark here is that uh, this picture which comes out of the parton model and which also works is actually too simple. It's deceptively uh, simple. There's much more physics going on. Uh, 
And that's not really surprising if you think about it. You have these two protons that collide. A proton has uh, sort of a transverse uh, size of something like half uh, a Fermi to a Fermi. Uh, you have uh, two uh, partons here that meet and annihilate. But of course, everyone else uh, here is also going to somehow be aware uh, that there is stuff coming uh, from the other side of the road. So these, what they're all, uh, often called spectators, spectators meaning they are not participating in the hard subpros, says the spectators will, spectators will nevertheless interact. They all carry color and color, colorful particles uh, want to interact in QCD. So you could have something like a glancing uh, uh, scattering of uh, sort of this pair of partons here just uh, as a sketch. If that's just a glancing low and low uh, momentum transfer uh, uh, reaction, uh, you shouldn't even literally think about quarks uh, here because low energy uh, reactions uh, for low energy reactions, we have no justification to speak about perturbation theory and really to speak about quarks. So this is a, a sketch here. But physically speaking, we do expect that the protons as they are broken up in this process, break into many pieces. Uh, and uh, what comes out is not only the part that is, that is produced in the hard scattering, uh, but also uh, remnants of the two protons uh, which have interacted with them, uh, each other. In the jargon uh, of PP collisions, this is also uh, called the underlying event. Now, if we had to calculate this here to get the uh, Drelian cross section, that would be terrible because, as I just uh, told you, it is non-perturbative physics. So at best, we can make uh, models for that physics and try and tune them to data, but we have no predictive power. The good news is that we don't need to compute uh, this type of reinteractions if we are only interested in the production of a lepton pair plus anything else, because how much and how this anything else has uh, scattered on each other uh, is irrelevant. Uh, and the reason for that is the same type of unitarity argument that I already used uh, for discussing E plus E minus to hadrons. When you go uh, to the final state uh, that is sufficiently inclusive, then all this detail here does not matter. Because loosely speaking, the probability uh, for something to happen here is one. And that's something I need, don't need to compute. But if I have an observable which is sensitive to how uh, the uh, uh, spectator partons turn into hadron fragments, then factorization does not work and I need a model for these uh, interactions. And that's one of these cases where one sees, aha, the parton model is good for some observables, but in the same reaction, I can measure uh, and be interested in other observables uh, for which the parton model or factorization does not work. So it's a mistake to think that everything factorizes, uh, and there are uh, clear counterindications to that. Now, coming back to the part of uh, the physics that factorization does predict, uh, it allows us now. Uh, using the same concepts to uh, compute many different processes. For example, well, you can produce on-shell Ws or Zs or other interesting colorless particles. A particularly interesting one is the Higgs boson, which was discovered almost 10 years ago. It has its 10th birthday this year. Uh, and you would treat them uh, pretty much in the same way as Australia. Um, and uh, in terms of nomenclature, a drill yan sometimes is meant to uh, refer to the case where you have an off-shell intermediate photon, but uh, in other uh, contexts, it subsumes uh, the production of a W or, or Z if uh, then these decay uh, leptonically. So there's a little bit of uh, loose language here and not a, a fully uh, codified uh, nomenclature. You can compute the production of jets, which I discussed earlier, be it in electron proton or in proton proton collisions. And the hard scale that you need here is provided uh, by the transverse momenta of these jets. Here, in that first case, it was the mass of the heavy particle. You can uh, predict and compute uh, 
final states that involve heavy quarks, heavy on the scale of non-perturbative QCD, and then the hard scale minimally is given by the uh, quark mass. Now the top quark and bottom quark masses are fairly large, but as you saw last lecture, the charm quark mass with its one point something uh, GeV mass, it's really a borderline case to use perturbation theory. Uh, and one cannot expect to be a uh, perturbation theory uh, the charm quark production uh, to be very precise, uh, certainly not at low orders, because alpha s at that scale is fairly large. So what is the value of this concept of factorization we've spoken about so much here? Well, it allows us to describe high energy processes and to use that, uh, we can use it as a tool. It allows us to study electroweak uh, part of the uh, standard model and to search for new particles. And uh, historical cases um, and, and present uh, day cases uh, in which uh, factorization was really important to get out uh, electroweak physics was the, uh, the discovery of the top quark at the Tevatron uh, in peeply barb collisions long time ago. Uh, the final state there, because the top quark decays in all possible ways, is so complicated that without a detailed prediction for your signal, produce a top quark uh, pair and let it decay, uh, it wouldn't have possible, been possible to discover it in that very, very messy environment. Something like the Higgs boson, uh, one could, uh, as it was discovered at the LHC, uh, you could see a resonance peak. So to determine that there was a new Higgs boson particle there, you didn't really need factorization. But if we now want to discover, uh, want to study uh, the properties of the Higgs boson, the strength of its coupling to all fermions and uh, to the bosons, which is absolutely necessary to, to, to see whether it is the Higgs boson predicted in the standard model, you need again uh, the formalism of factorization in order to be able to make a prediction uh, for the strong interaction part of the uh, process. And finally, you can use uh, factorization to turn uh, around uh, uh, the logic taking a hard scattering process that you understand well and determine the parton densities um, and thereby also to learn about proton uh, structure. Now, since there are so many part different partons, uh, one needs a lot of processes and next uh, lecture, I will say a little bit about that. So now uh, there's a little bit more to say about fragmentation function, but given the time, I will skip that and uh, speak uh, beyond the tree level in the hard scattering. So let's come back to our textbook example of inclusive uh, DIS. And this is just part of the handback graph, uh, which one would compute. So the lower part of the handback here, I've uh, not drawn. If you go beyond the uh, tree level, uh, you can start, uh, you, you start inputting gluons in different ways. One way is this, one another way is that. Uh, if you have an uh, ultraviolet divergence, like uh, here, you uh, just, because this is a vertex correction, you just use the standard uh, UV renormalization, you know what to do. You expect to get soft divergences, which come from the region where this gluon here or there has a four momentum equal to zero. And uh, similarly to the case uh, of uh, E plus E minus to hadrons uh, discussed before, uh, these soft divergences appear in individual graphs, but they cancel if you sum over all graphs. But lastly, you have collinear divergences where this blue on here or there is collinear that is almost proportional in its momentum uh, to the incoming quark line. And these divergences do not cancel. So if you sum over all graphs, even then, if KT denotes the uh, transverse momentum of this gluon with respect of the uh, parent quark, then you get uh, an integral which at low values of KT behaves like such. And that's a logarithmic divergence, which doesn't cancel. And that means we haven't fully uh, done the physics right. Typically, when you get a divergent uh, result, in a calculation, it means that you're missing something in the logic. So what did we do wrong here, physically speaking? 
Well, we should remember uh, what this uh, separation of a graph into a hard and a collinear subgraphs uh, really uh, prescribes. The hard graph should not contain internal collinear lines because internal collinear lines should be in the collinear subgraph. So if you think of having some graph with some hard particles here and collinear particles there, and you add this gluon here, then there's two possibilities. Either the gluon momentum is collinear to the uh, other stuff in the proton. And then this is where you should put it. That's the low KT part. Or uh, the uh, uh, gluon here uh, is not collinear. And only then uh, does it belong into the hard part, which you compute in perturbation theory. So in other words, you shouldn't literally uh, compute this integral down to kt equals zero. And if you were to work with a cutoff, what you could do is to say, well, uh, the, the part of the integral with kt bigger than some separation scale, the inverse of that uh, is a, a distance. And you could solve, say that's the transverse uh, resolution with which I see that quark. Um, then the large kt part of the integral would uh, sit inside here. That would be finite. And the low kt part would sit inside the parton density, which we don't try to compute perturbatively anyway. Now, in the for the same reason uh, as you don't like to work with cutoffs in uh, UV uh, in ultraviolet renormalization, uh, you don't like to work with it uh, for uh, correctly treating the collinear region. It's just that it uh, messes up the problem. And beyond leading order, still true, uh, it becomes an impossible mess. So one does uh, the same trick as I discussed last time for ultraviolet physics. One can use dimensional regularization again. So one would then compute this uh, loop integral for the hard part down to k equal, kt equals 0. But uh, in uh, d different from four space-time dimensions. Now, for ultraviolet divergences, one needs to make d smaller than four in order to make these divergences finite. For collinear divergences, it's the opposite uh, way, because here the problem uh, sits at small kt. What you want is to have a, 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 an integration volume that's a little bit bigger than this case uh, kt squared. Uh, so you take uh, more than two sp uh, transverse space-time dimensions, or d, uh, e uh, bigger than four. Otherwise, it's exactly the same uh, uh, rules of calculation. So what we do in dim DIMREC is uh, we compute in d different from four dimensions. And the collinear divergence uh, in this graph here then turns out to be a one over epsilon pole. And that has to be subtracted. At the same time, if you think of the definition of the parton density, here we should actually uh, not include the ultraviolet divergence that you would get by integrating over this key kt over all possible values. So uh, the same physics uh, from the point of view of the parton density means you should not subtract only a collinear part here. You should also subtract the ultraviolet part or the high KT part there. And that is a standard uh, ultraviolet uh, divergence, except it's one that comes not from the QCD Lagrangian, but instead it comes from the product of operators uh, that you uh, write down uh, when you define this matrix elements. Yeah? So if you do this consistently, then you're not just subtracting something uh, that you don't like, rather you're subtracting something here, putting it back here, and that is a consistent result. So what does that tell us? Uh, what's the result? Well, what's, what are the manifestations of this procedure? Well, just as renormalized quantities uh, in QCD, you now get again a dependence on the scale. Think of it as a cutoff scale, if you like, or as the scale of dimensional regularization. Uh, this is now physically the scale at which 
we uh, decide whether uh, to put a, a degree of freedom inside the heart scattering, which is the process, or whether we put it inside the structure of the target. And that means our pattern distributions become scale dependent. And this dependence of the pattern distributions on that scale, similarly to the dependence of alpha s on its scale, is given uh, by a differential equation. And for pattern distributions, these equations are called the Deglove equations after five physicists. So what is the form of this, uh, of this uh, differential equation? Well, the logarithmic divergence, uh, the, sorry, the logarithmic derivative with respect to the scale is given by a lot of this kind of emission process, amplitude squared. So this here is a graph of the amplitude, since you always have squares here, uh, it's actually the square of that amplitude. And that is what is called a splitting function, conventionally called P. And then there is, uh, again, the same pattern distribution, but evaluated at a different momentum fraction, uh, which you can think of as the momentum fraction before the emission took place. So this here is written uh, in a form that uh, is manifestly um, uh, invariant under boosts. Uh, the splitting function doesn't actually know about the proton momentum, only the pattern distribution knows. So it cannot depend uh, by itself on a momentum fraction that is defined with respect to the moment uh, to the momentum uh, of the proton. So in order to get rid of the proton momentum, which this function knows nothing about, uh, you can see that you have to take uh, the ratio of the momentum fraction before and after or after and before the splitting process, because that's what P describes. In uh, likewise, in order uh, for this uh, integration element to be independent uh, of the proton momentum as a reference, uh, uh, you divide it by x prime. So what is known about these splitting functions? They can be computed in perturbation theory. And that's again, one of these quantities, which because they are so important, uh, have been computed to very high order, uh, up to three loops uh, some uh, two decades ago almost, and uh, partially up to four loops uh, to get the full complete for loop result uh, is still an ongoing ent uh, enterprise. These are not mathematically speaking smooth functions. They have a distributional part at uh, the point where uh, their argument is equal to one. Argument to equal to one means that the splitting, uh, the, the momentum fraction before and after the splitting is equal. And that comes uh, from having a, a virtual correction here in which uh, this part on the gluon is actually not radiated away, but it's sort of emitted and reabsorbed right away. And then obviously x prime is equal to x. For a fully consistent treatment, these needs to be taken into account. There's more to the story. Uh, you cannot only have a quark that radiates uh, a gluon and therefore becomes slower. You can also change, of course, you can have a gluon that radiates a gluon and becomes slower, but you can also change a gluon into a quark or an antiquark and a quark into a gluon, depending on which uh, uh, particle after the splitting uh, process is the one uh, that enters the heart scattering. So that means the uh, equation uh, for the scale dependence of parton distributions uh, couples quark and uh, anti-quark and gluon distributions uh, by these transitions. And the whole thing uh, can be written then in terms of a matrix uh, and vector notation. Physically speaking, this means that when you ask uh, what is the density of quarks inside the proton, you have to specify at which resolution scale you want that answer. Because what looks like a quark at some scale, if you have a finer resolution scale, uh, could be a gluon that later on uh, splits into a quark and antiquark, where that splitting becomes part of your hard process rather than of what you call the structure of the proton. So that's very important. The kind of questions uh, about structure of hadrons you can meaningfully ask uh, 
uh, in a quantum field theory like QCD uh, has to be well thought of. And in this case, it depends uh, on the resolution scale at which uh, you are able to probe the system. So uh, a few words about uh, a very uh, useful concept uh, when one uh, treats these um, uh, parton, uh, these evolution equations. Uh, this here is a uh, differential equation with an integral on the right-hand side. So to solve that is a rather complicated procedure mathematically, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, it can be done numerically, that's not a problem, but it can also be analytically if you uh, make uh, use of a trick. Namely, one can take what is called Mellon moments, take the part on distributions and I omit uh, the mu argument here because it's not part of what we need in this line here, um, multiplied with some power uh, of X, the minus one here is conventional, other people actually leave it out, J uh, can even be a complex number here and integrate over all X from zero to one. You can do the same thing for the splitting function and that's then called uh, anomalous dimension for historical reasons, which I don't want to explain here. So a, a simple exercise, uh, which I encourage you to do is to show that if uh, you have this integral differential equation uh, for uh, the uh, parton distribution here, by the way, this kind of Convolution integral is called a Mellin convolution. If you go to moment space, uh, this becomes an ordinary product on the right hand side. And this here is much easier to solve uh, analytically. In fact, if you don't have mixing between different parton uh, flavors, and that you can achieve by taking certain flavor, uh, so called flavor non singlet combinations like up minus down quarks in which the mixing with gluons drops out. So then here, if this is the difference of Mellon moments for the up and down quark distribution, uh, then this here has exactly the same form as the uh, equation for the running mass, which uh, you already learned how to solve. Another important aspect of these Mellon moments is the following. Let's go back to the matrix element definition that I discussed earlier. So the only place where the X momentum fraction here appears is inside this exponential. All the rest of the stuff depends on uh, the conjugate uh, distance. Now there is an operator identity, which written down here is a rather, rather lengthy thing, but uh, what you see is if I just take away the external proton state here and there, and just look at this assemblage of operators, I have this Fourier transform. I leave out any uh, global factors here, which I'm not interested in right now. If you take the Mellon moment of this, what the X integration does here is it turns the exponential into either uh, the uh, delta function in Z minus, that's if n is equal to one, or if n is bigger than one, it turns it into the derivative, uh, some derivative of the delta function. And that means uh, that uh, if you have a delta function or one of its derivative, uh, you uh, go from a non-local operator here where the fields sit at different positions to a local operator where all fields sit at the same position. And it turns out depending on uh, which uh, index you take here, now this here should uh, not be a complex number, but some natural number, uh, then uh, you find that you get uh, so and so many uh, numbers of covariant derivatives, uh, which is defined here. And the details of that uh, you're encouraged to look at uh, in uh, an exercise uh, to verify this operator identity uh, for n equal one, which means no weighting factor here. That's the simplest. And also so, so for n equal two, which is a bit more complicated. So we have uh, the important statement that if you take a Mellon moment of this matrix element, uh, you get uh, the matrix element of an operator that's much simpler, namely it is a local operator or sometimes also called a current. Now we have to uh, be careful here because in order for this integral here to give you a delta function, you must integral over all 
possible values of x. And I showed you earlier that actually the possible values of x in this matrix element are not between 0 and 1, they are between minus 1 and 1, because the negative part of this corresponds to the antiquark distributions. So if you look uh, more carefully, you find that for odd uh, values of n, and more carefully means you should use uh, this relation here, replace f with q of x for so positive x with minus q bar of minus x for so negative x. If you plug that in, you find that uh, for odd n, uh, this here is a Mellon moment of the difference uh, of quark and antiquark distributions, whereas for even n, it's the Mellon moment of a sum of quark and antiquark distributions. And this has far reaching consequences for some rules. Uh, it can also be repeated. Uh, you can use this operator identity also when you think about generalized pattern distributions, and that will play a very important role in the lectures by Barbara Paschini. So question to Sergio, can I have five more minutes today or should I stop here? Oh, I don't know actually, it's up to you maybe. I don't know if Laura is uh, eager to, to, to start a lecture. You, you, sure, maybe sure. Just go ahead, go ahead, five minutes, it's okay. Huh? Thank you, Laura. So okay. uh, let me just wrap that up here because we're close to the finishing line. Uh, after all, we discussed how does a factorization formula look like, for example, for proton-proton producing a Higgs boson and anything else in the hadronic final state. So this is now going beyond the parton model. It's really coming out of QCD. It has to be a sufficiently inclusive final state, otherwise factorization doesn't even work, as I told you. We get an integral over the momentum fractions of two parton distributions with different uh, and suitable uh, flavors. Each of them depends on the factorization scale, which I discussed. Then you have the hard scattering cross section that depends on the momentum fractions of the incoming partons on alpha s, which itself depends on a renormalization scale. And it depends on these uh, scales also via explicit logarithms from higher orders. And in this case, it depends, of course, on external kinematic quantities. In this case, it's the Higgs mass. Important is that there are uh, corrections to this, which are suppressed as inverse powers of the hard scale with the numerator pro being provided uh, by something like a GV, which is uh, the um, intrinsic scale of non perturbative QCD. This type of power correction is what comes out of all the approximations we've made along the way by deriving the first part of this formula. Uh, remember, this cannot be exact. We neglected the small parts of momentum components, and all this neglecting stuff ends up in these power corrections. That's important, especially in cases where the hard scale is not the Higgs mass, which is huge, and you can safely forget this, but where the hard scale is something like the bottom quark mass, which is 5 GeV or 4 GeV, and then you start to worry about such corrections if you're interested in very high precision. We have the renormalization scale and the factorization scale. In practice, one uh, might take them different or equal, depends on your taste. Um, and just as I've shown you that the renormalization scale dependence uh, of an observable must cancel out up to uncalculated higher orders, the same holds uh, for the mu f dependence, and that can be shown in a very similar way as it can be shown for mu r. So the limits of accuracy of factorization formulae are on one hand given as the power in the alpha x expansion in which you can treat the evolution of the PDFs and of the heart uh, uh, and the computation of the heart scattering cross section and only important in some cases by uh, the size of power corrections, which very, very often one is not able to compute at all. So, to have a look at how this scale dependence uh, looks like, let's take some examples here. Uh, this is for producing a, a Z or a gamma star, that means a lepton pair. And it's the differential cross-section differential in the rapidity of that pair. 
And you see by a scale variation, in this case, the two scales were set equal and varied by a factor one half up and down. There is a very substantial scale variation at leading order, much less so at next leading order and even less so at next to next leading order. And as I discussed in detail uh, for the pure renormalization scale dependence, you might take uh, this type of scale variation as an estimate for the higher uncomputed orders. And as we saw uh, already for the mu r uh, variation, uh, that estimate is not more than an estimate because there's no guarantee that your estimate of uncertainty for the leading order includes the true next to leading order, which in this case it doesn't. However, as you go to higher and higher orders, typically uh, that estimate becomes better and better. Same thing here for the rapidity uh, dependence of fixed boson production, only that you see generically uh, the size of these uncertainties is much bigger. That has to do, roughly speaking, with the fact that the Higgs couples to gluons, gluons have a more color octet compared with uh, the quarks, uh, which carry only a triplet. Uh, so the higher order corrections uh, by their color factors tend to be more important uh, than the Higgs boson. And here is a, a more recent uh, plot uh, for the uh, factor, the, the scale dependence of the Higgs boson uh, cross section, which was established uh, after people computed the next to next to leading order calculation, uh, the, the N3 LO, the next to next to next order leading order calculation, which you see here. And again, the same general pattern leading order, which is this curve here, even the scale variation doesn't help you to guess correctly what the next to leading order is. And you have to go to high orders uh, for this kind of uh, game. Uh, to be less sensitive to your guess what is a good uh, scale choice. Uh, let me skip uh, over this here. Well, let me just briefly say, scale variation is a dirt cheap and limited way of estimating higher orders. What you can also do and what is done here is if you have computed enough orders, just see if you can find any pattern and if you can understand when uh, corrections are supposed to be big. And the most drastic jump you typically have when you go from leading to next to leading order, and that is often because at leading order, you just have a very special case. For example, at leading order, the Drelyan or the DIS processes uh, don't see the gluon distribution yet because it, you can only have quark or anti-quark distributions at leading order. Gluon distributions are very large compared with quark distributions in certain regions. And therefore switching on next to leading order corrections, you uh, have an enhancement that just comes from the non-perturbative part uh, of the input uh, and therefore is not captured by saying this is of order alpha s. Here's the summary of part three. Uh, let me not walk you through it. I think I've said everything. And instead uh, of a summary, I want to show you this plot which uh, I regard as an enormous triumph of theory and experiment. This is the measurement uh, of a large number of standard model production cross sections at the LHC, rather recent update. Here uh, is uh, shown uh, the uh, um, value of the cross section. So it, it spans many orders of magnitude from very frequent to very rare processes. And shear shown is uh, the ratio data over theory prediction, uh, including the error bands. And you see that for a large range of these processes, the theory works incredibly well. There's cases where errors are big, both from theory and or from experiment. Um, and that's where you have to invest more work. But overall, I think this shows much better than any uh, verbal uh, statement uh, how enormously successful this factorization concept is. And with this, I stop for today. Thanks for your patience. Thank you very much, Marcus. Very interesting, very nice. Questions to Marcus? Urgent ones? Many nice comments, but no questions. Okay, so um, the exercises as usual are collected uh, in the last slide, so you can take a look. You want to prepare yourself, this uh, 
a few exercises which will be discussed in tomorrow's session, um, but certainly not all of them. And uh, starting from here, if you want to look at it, this will uh, certainly only dis be discussed on Wednesday, likewise the one afterwards. Uh, so for tomorrow, you just uh, should look, uh, uh, take a look at uh, the two first slides here.